recording and then then we'll go from there. Great. Welcome to season two, episode five of The Open Educator, the best place to be on a Tuesday morning. Thank you for everyone for joining us and for taking that step to grow professionally. And I would encourage everyone to turn on their camera if possible and to listen attentively. The entrepreneurship program is very unique compared to the rest of programs at USF. And we've talked about how entrepreneurship in the conventional sense is the idea that an individual creating their own business and growing it. But entrepreneurship is expanded and you can be an entrepreneur or think entrepreneurially uh, and innovatively even within a firm and all the different products that we buy, services we consume, someone had to invent that, someone had to build that, someone had to scale that and create value out of that idea. And we build individuals who work for Google, Apple, Facebook, and the big tech companies. So that's another path within the entrepreneurship and innovation realm. And lastly, we build individuals to create and define the careers that they define themselves, not what others define for them. And our next guest is doing just that. So I'm very proud uh, to have a role model for the St. Pete and Tampa Bay community, someone I've gotten to know over various events through the uh, community channels, and a guest who I would argue lives and breathes all of the concepts in all of our classes uh, that we learn here in Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program. So he's the owner of Intermezzo Cafe and Cocktail, a leader in helping develop St. Pete and the Tampa Bay community as it grows. So please give a warm welcome to Jarrett Sabatini, a USF alum. So we do this during sign language as, as a applause. So Jared, right. welcome. Okay. Thank you for joining us this morning. Where does this cast find you? And can you kind of bring us up to speed on what you've been working on? Yeah. So, well, good morning, everyone. And thanks for being here and taking the time to, uh, to tune in. Um, I, I'm in my apartment right now, and I figured this is going to be the most quiet spot that I could do this. I wanted to do it in the cafe, but I think there's just too many distractions. And um, what was it? What am I up to now? Right yeah. now? Um, yeah. Bring us up to speed. The most exciting things. Yeah, I mean, my day-to-day is just uh, focusing on Intermezzo, trying to grow it. We're four years old now, and um, trying to come up with ways to get you know people in the door, to get the name out. I mean, it's amazing. Even four years, people still come in every day who live in St. Pete and they go, how long have you been open? You know, or uh, I've, I've never been here before. So uh, it keeps you motivated, I guess, to keep to keep getting the word out. Because we have an audience that spans worldwide and not yep. everyone may have been down central. What What is Intermezzo Cafe and Cocktail and how did it start? So Intermezzo, it translates to intermission. Um, it's a, it's a coffee and cocktail bar. So it's called Intermezzo Coffee and Cocktails. And I started it four years ago. The name Intermezzo, like I said, means intermission. And the idea was to provide an, you know, intermission, so to speak, or a break in one's day. And, uh, you know, when I was thinking of names, I thought, what is my personal connection to coffee? And we started only as coffee in the beginning and I'll get into that, but we, we graduated into cocktails. Uh, but I thought, what was my personal connection to coffee? And I always enjoyed going to a, a cafe as sort of a, a break in my day, as sort of a, to spend 20 or 30 minutes to wind down and, you know, maybe listen to a podcast or music or read a book or even catch up with a friend or something. But it was sort of a break in between work and school at the time when I was going to USF and that kind of thing. So, um, so that's how, so that's how that started, but we're four now and you know, when I started, um, you know, and not everyone knows, but we started as a pop-up coffee shop. And so, you know, that means that basically I, I only had this space leased for three months and I didn't foresee it going for more than three months in that particular location. Uh, but as luck would have it, we had the ability to stay there and grow there. But in the beginning, it was it was really only supposed to be there for three months. And that's what I was telling people every time they'd come in. I go, hey, you know, we're just a pop up. We're going to be here till I think it was like December 1st. I started in like October or something. Um, and then everyone was like, what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean you're only going to be here for three months? You're 
I'm like, yeah, we only have the space for three months. And then if it works, we're going to move it, you know, and if it doesn't work, then we, you know, we tried. So one thing that I like to connect is what we learn in the classroom and see how it plays out in, in practice. And you've ha- highlighted two things that we try to emphasize. One, this idea of story or creating this broader narrative. And so much of the story and narrative is tied to not only individual businesses, but also products. And when you came up with the name, you know, it had meaning. You're trying to create meaning behind the broader brand, the broader story of, of your company, but also the notion of a pop-up, which some of us may know it as maybe a prototype or a way of testing the market and getting feedback. Is it work going to work? And we probably see this in many different industries within retail and various spots, or I know maybe you got in many of the different cities that we live in or have experienced, you may have seen that on the street, <clears throat> particularly in New York. Um, Jared, I know you said the style was 1950s, 60s Italian coffee bar. Where did, where did that come up with? And like, how did that play into the broader uh, vision that you had? Yeah, so I, um, you know, when I moved to St. Pete, it was about seven years ago, there wasn't a ton of coffee options. Not like today, there's like coffee shops everywhere and a lot of them are very good. But at the time, there was only one or two local cafes and I frequented them and I liked them, but I I always had my own vision of how I would do things. And I grew up in a restaurant industry, you know, restaurant family, Italian family. And so I sort of had a idea of the way coffee or food should taste or the way it should be presented, right? Just my own opinion. And, um, and so over the years, I sort of unconsciously was like putting it together. And then when I decided I wanted to have a cafe, I kind of had it in mind already of what I wanted to do. And I, I love the 1950s era uh, in culture and music and film and everything um, and, and early 1960s. And so you know, when I did the cafe, I wanted it to reflect that. I wanted it to reflect some of those values and like just that that sort of tone. And so in Italy, cafes even today are not regular coffee shops as we know it here in this country. They're more like hybrid coffee shop and bars. And so if you and not only Italy, but this is Spain and France and Vienna and things like that, but uh, sort of the old world. They, you could go in there, you have a coffee or cappuccino, but you also have different liqueurs and things like that, that you can, you can sip on. And they're more conversational. Uh, Usually there's not TVs in these spots. Sometimes there are, but they're, they're meant to be more conversational and more of like a, you sit down and take a break, if you will. And so that's where, that's where I kind of wanted to be. And, and it wasn't really well represented here. And I, You know, I try to go up to like New York City, for example, once a year. I have family in Long Island, but I try to go to the city just to almost refresh and get inspired because there's all these really cool concepts. And um, and so that's part of, you know, that played into it as well as places I've seen uh, and I've taken little notes and kind of put it together myself. So one thing that we stress in the classes that I teach is the notion of, of research and trying to know the market. And while you mentioned there was not a cafe that was fitting the bill that you were looking for, but you noticed that there was some differences and there could be a niche or an opportunity in the market. The same thing when you went to New York, you know, what is going on? You're being inspired or finding bits of creativity, other places that you can mash up and do something your own. So these are all concepts of that we're trying to teach uh, the students or get more comfortable. And maybe you did it unconsciously you know we went you could go to this cafe and this cafe and this one has sports on or this one is more business type or but you're you're taking notice and awareness and these are part of this this skill of research that we're trying to embed in order to identify the opportunity and gap uh within any of our business ideas or ventures so i'm really curious because you said it was a pop-up and i know what that space was before you took over and and you know intermezzo we talk about serendipity and the idea you have to pitch or the idea that, you know, things don't just fall from the sky. Would you share a little story on what you had to do in order to try to break in and get that space? Yeah. Yeah. So I, so I opened Intermezzo, it was about three or four months after I graduated. Um, But for 
six or seven months prior to that, I was kind of snooping around St. Pete, um, looking at, um, you know, for lease signs and for sale and calling people. And I really didn't know what I was getting into. I just knew that I wanted to open up a spot, but I didn't quite know. I wasn't savvy enough to know sort of um, how to get there. Right. So I'm just picking up the phone and calling real estate people and landlords and saying, hey, I want to lease a spot. How much is it? What does it include? Da da da, and I'm just trying to learn the language. Well, this particular spot where I'm at now, I um, the landlord has, you know, at this point uh, recently bought the building. He cleaned it up, and so it was really sticking out on that street. And there's a big for lease sign in the window, and I remember calling it two or three times, not getting an answer, and leaving a message and saying, "Hey, I'm a, you know, I always pulled the student card because." Yeah. Frankly, it kind of it really does get you in the door a lot of the times, and I wish I could still pull it. But hey, I'm a student at USF. I'm you know about to graduate. I'm opening up a cafe, right? And so I kind of I purposely was like, I'm opening up a cafe. I'm trying to phrase it as if I am already doing it, even though I'm kind of getting it ahead of myself, right? But um, but I left a message, and I never got a call back from this particular guy, and. Um, it wasn't the landlord. It was some real estate agent they were working with at the time. And so, but I, I really wanted to learn more about this building because I love the building. I still love it. Right. And one day I was eating lunch at Bodega, which is across the street. And I remember I rode my bike up there. I was having lunch. And if you've been to Bodega, you wait 10 to 15 minutes, no matter what. Right. And they're usually pretty good about that. But, and I'm waiting and I'm just kind of leaning against the pole and I'm looking at the building across the street and I see somebody exit the building and I thought, okay, well, here's a live body. I'm going to go talk to this person. And so, you know, I leave bodega. I'm still waiting on my sandwich. I walk back, I walk over there and I, I was like, excuse me, I've been trying to get in contact with someone, you know, I want to lease the space. And it was a general contractor who was installing something or whatever. And he was like, uh, okay, I'm not the guy, but I, but I could introduce you to the guy. And they happen to be, uh, he owned a few buildings on Central Avenue. He happened to be down the block. So I, I took a walk with him a block away. They were redeveloping what is now Grassroots Kava House, and they were turning that into, it was just dilapidated into a nice building. Um, and I met another person, and then that person was like, oh, you're looking for so-and-so, let me introduce you. So then that person brought me to another place, and then the landlord who's John um, appeared and I liked him right away because he was wearing a New York Yankees hat. And uh, even though I'm, I'm still a Rays fan, but, um, and so we, we started to talk about New York. We started talking about the cafe. He showed me the space. Um, and I told him what I wanted to do with it. And he started to pick my brain a little bit. And I told him about my background, which is that I grew up in restaurants for the past, you know, four years at the time, five years, I was working as a, you know, cocktail bartender. I was working in wine. I, I had my sommelier uh, certificate. So I was really interested in that, but I took this interest in coffee because it wasn't very well represented here. And then I thought I could do a good job and et cetera. And so uh, he said, well, why don't, he said, the space isn't for lease. Um, he says, I have a tenant that's starting in six months. But for the next three or four, it's going to be open. Why don't you take it for that amount of time? And, you know, he said, we'll do a pop up. And I knew the term pop up and I was somewhat familiar with it, but I but I never heard of anyone doing it around here. And I wasn't quite sure of how it worked logistically, like, you know, how how it worked with a landlord or all these types of, types of things. But he made it very simple because he came from that that world in New York anyways. And so I said I thought to myself, OK, Worst case scenario is I lease this space for three months, and if it doesn't work, then I don't have a long-term commitment here. Uh, best case scenario is that it works. I have this prime spot on Central, and if it if I can't get this spot, then I can move it to another spot, and I've already started uh, gaining a following, ideally, and I've already learned you know the ins and outs of the business somewhat. And so I thought, okay, the risk-reward is pretty good here. And so we did it. And then during those three months, we got to know each other, you know, Intermezzo started to develop a brand and a name and people started to like it. And I started to get real feedback from people. 
and we started to become pretty fairly popular for being a spot that was only open for three months with no advertising. You know, it was all it was all just local word of mouth. And um, and then, you know, we started to discuss staying there longer. He had a bigger vision for the neighborhood. And, you know, he said, well, you came from bars and the wine world and the restaurant world. Why don't we do a bar, too? And so we partnered up and then Intermezzo Coffee became Intermezzo Coffee and Cocktails about five months into it. Um, and then at that point, we, you know, sort of, you know, now we're here, we are four years later and we've grown a ton. What one of the things when I hear you just share that story, the, the role of serendipity in our creativity and innovation class, we take a creativity assessment and the role of serendipity might play a, a way of inspiring us. But you saw the person walk out of the, the door and you chased them down. They connected you, connected you. And now you have a partnership. I also know you mm -hmm. have another you had another partnership. So think of this. Intermezzo being a pop-up, but then you say, we also need to reduce risk. You have a pop-up inside Intermezzo, which you had the oyster share. Right. So talk about that, because that was also a unique uh, approach as well. Yeah, so a few months into having the bar, um, you know, the Edge District, which is where we're at now, four or five years into it, has grown a ton and it's become an identifiable neighborhood with housing and all this stuff. But back then, it was it was still uh, growing. People didn't really know what the edge was, and so uh, one of the ideas in and this is actually my partner's idea. He had a connection with an oyster shucker who had this traveling van, and he said, "What if we did this oyster pop up bar within the business?" And at the time, I'll be honest, I was actually skeptical. I was like, "I don't know, oysters and coffee didn't sound right. Coffee and oyster, or I'm sorry, cocktails and oysters sound good." And I just thought, okay, this might be weird, but I was willing to try it. And I had trust because he had a lot more experience than I did. And I thought, you know, we need to get our name out there. So let's do it. And we did it. And it was, I mean, you know, it was amazing because we actually, we made the front page of the Tampa Bay Times the very next week because no one, no one ever did that. No one thought, okay, we're going to do a pop-up oyster bar within this business that is still, this business was a pop-up and et cetera. And so at that point forward, we, we sort of adopted this um, philosophy of pop-ups and, you know, being creative and being flexible. Um, and it's helped us a ton. And we've done a few pop-ups since then. But the Oyster thing really helped us get the word out there because as much as in my mind, I thought that if we did really good, co you know, craft coffee and cocktails, that the word would spread. And it did, but it was just spreading slower Right. And there's a smaller market for that, I think, here. But now it now it's growing a ton and it has grown at the time in that neighborhood. I don't think there was people lining up for that. And even though the few people that were were diehard loyalists. Uh, and so the oyster thing helped spread that a lot faster. Wonderful. And, you know, now we say intermezzo coffee and cocktails. But as you said, it was originally just coffee. And we don't intuitively think that going from one beverage to another beverage would be so challenging. But my understanding is there's very big differences. Can you share a bit about the learning curve that you had to go through? And was it easy just to transition? And, and how did you deal with that, with the business and, and everything that you were offering? Yeah, um, I'm still learning that part. <laughs> um, we, it, it is challenging because coffee and cocktail, you know, bartenders and baristas, they're, they have a lot of similarities, but they also have a lot of differences. And so, you know, when I was hiring people for coffee, it turns out that most of them are not that interested in learning cocktail making. And then when I'm hiring for bartenders, it turns out that a lot of them aren't as interested in learning coffee. And some are, but they really want to specialize in their particular field, which is understandable. And so that was something that you know, just in the last year, year and a half, I've really started to understand and learn how to train for and learn how to hire for. But for the first two to three years, it was it was really challenging. So, for example, you know, what I did was in the beginning when we got the bar aspect and we got the liquor license, I only did coffee from 8 a.m. until 5 p.m. And then I, I did a hard stop. And then 5 p.m. to midnight, let's say we did cocktails. And so I started sort of pitching and communicating intermezzo as coffee by day, cocktails by night, right? And you can't get coffee at night and you can't get cocktails during the day. And the reason why I did that is because I, 
yeah, I wanted to control the quality of it and I wanted to control the experience as best as I could for people. I didn't want to just throw a bunch of cocktails on the menu during the day and a bunch of coffee at night and have and not have my employees trained uh, to my expectations to make it properly. And so I thought, okay, if, if someone comes in, I want them to get the same quality experience no matter what time of day. So I, so I said no cocktails during the day, no coffee at night. And then, of course, over, over the next few weeks and months, people were like, well, isn't this a coffee shop? Why can't I get a cappuccino at 5.01 p.m.? You know, or how come I can't get an Aperol spritz at 2 p.m.? And so I thought, okay, we'll slowly integrate it. And so we put just a few cocktails on the menu during the day. And we put just espresso beverages at night. Um, and I trained them how to do those things. And then it, it kind of grew. And I just did that step by step until I felt comfortable. Uh, and the employees felt comfortable learning how to do those things properly. And now, um, you know, fast forward to 2021, we have co cocktails all day. We have coffee all night. And then all of our employees or most of our employees are cross trained to be able to do both. And I've set up, you know, sort of SOPs, if you will, to learn how to mitigate the risk on those and mitigate the margin of error so that they always come out good and they're consistent because consistency is one of the most important things for uh, a restaurant or a coffee shop or a bar. Uh, I want to prime the students, you know, think about what questions you have for Jared and, you know, what you might want to hear more of. You talked about the HR aspect of the barista, the drink maker, the bartender, mixologist. Is there some, what was the biggest challenges that you were facing or the biggest challenge that you faced in trying to scale this or some you know, aspect of the business that um, you're learning, you're still learning or you, that you find the biggest challenge in managing? Um, one of the biggest challenges historically and then even something i still struggle with is just managing people in general and so you know you, it's not something that i thought about when you're you know let's say you're daydreaming about the business you want to own one day right you always think in terms of the the best right you're like oh i'm going to be able to do what i love and i'm going to be able to sort of like market it the way i want and design the product i want or whatever it is and but you know you have all these other all these other sides of the business that um, that can be fun, but are very challenging. And so one of those for me is managing people. And so right now we have 10 or 11 people that work at Intermezzo. Um, and that was a big learning curve is I, you know, trying to manage people all have different needs. They all have different personalities and they all, uh, want different things. And so you have to learn how to, you know, be empathetic. You have to work with people, try to figure out, how to make the best for everyone while also trying to demand a really high quality product. So, mm -hmm. so it is challenging. Um, I would say, um, oh man, I was gonna, as far as the hiring process goes, I guess what I wanted to mention is that something that has mitigated it for me or made it a little bit easier is this book that I read by a restaurant tour in New York city. His name's Danny Meyer. He's most famous now for starting Shake Shack, but if you if you're you know if you read into him, that's like the least cool thing he's done. He's done all these great restaurants and stuff in New York City, and started when he was 27 uh, in in a part of Manhattan that at the time wasn't very popular. And one of the things he talks about as far as hiring is he has this rule. It's called the 51% rule, and his philosophy is basically that an employee out of 100%. Uh, there's a split between like EQ, like emotional and like quality and then technical quality. And so technical would be, we'll just take like a restaurant setting. A technical quality would be you can ho hold a drink uh, on a tray correctly. You make sure the waters are filled without the guest having to notice it. You, you know, you always have the reservation available. The place is clean, like that kind of thing. It's all the technical skills. The emotional side of that is, is hospitality, which is the feeling you get when you go to a spot. And so that's like making someone feel like they're part of the family or feel like you actually want them there and that you actually want to make someone happy uh, and that you actually care what they're ordering. And so this, this guy, Danny Meyer, says that for, for hiring the 51% rule, which is someone should be 51% uh, with EQ, right, emotional quality, and then 49% technical. That's the perfect employee because 
they're slightly more hospitable than they are technical. They might drop a drink every now and then, or they might forget the fork when you, when they, you know, serve you dinner, but the way that they make you feel makes up for it. And they're so nice about it. And they actually, you know, you feel like this person actually cares about what they're putting in front of you. Um, and so I always had that in mind when I was hiring and so it's helped and I've still learned some hard lessons with people. Right. But it's definitely helped us because I've hired for personality and we always, to this day, it's the number one thing that I, I constantly, I probably annoy my team about. I'm like hospitality, hospitality. That's how we're going to be different. That's how we're going to be better because anyone can serve a coffee. Right. And, but it's hard to like, you know, make someone feel good about that and make someone feel like this is their neighborhood cafe and that kind of thing. And frankly, that was one of the things I always hated when I go to certain cafes that are really, let's say it's like a really nice coffee shop and there's really into coffee. Well, I would go in and I, sometimes I just didn't feel cool enough. You know, I just didn't feel like I was hip enough to be there. And I knew a lot about coffee, right? And I wanted to pick someone's brain, a barista about the different nuances of coffee or whatever. But at the time I was like, man, I, some cafes, I just didn't feel like they wanted me there. I didn't feel like they were that interested. They just were there because it's like a nice place for Instagram or something. And so that's one of the things that I'm like, I feel like I'm allergic to that um, sort of elite mentality. And I tried to become, try to make Intermezzo as hospitable as possible. And, and so going back to hiring, I've always hired for personality and tried to train on technical. And I think it's, I've still learned some lessons, but it's, it's, it's helped out a lot. So this is wonderful. The reason why I like what you what you've shared is we all have bad days, right? But if you're in hospitality, and I would argue in any job, right? If it's you're you're dealing with another coworker and you're you're in the cube next to you or whatever, right? It, how do you make that person feel, right? You don't want to be the person who's, you know, you're not you're there to support the other people if it's to provide them through. Um, a beverage or or whatever, but you also have to put on your game face when you're at work. How, even if you're having a bad day, the customer is not about you hearing your stories. You have to make the customer feel comfortable. And I think that also applies to other types of businesses as well. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, you know, it's important to leave that stuff at the door and to try to remember what your job is and, and to be professional about it and to not take things personally, you know, at the end of the day. And, and hospitality in the restaurant industry is even more so, you know, focused on that uh, because you're dealing with guests all day and, and every person who walks in, they might, you don't know where they're coming from. They could be having the best day of their life or the worst day. And so your job is to, you know, obviously get them what they want, but also try to give a genuine interest in them and make them feel good and that kind of thing. Wonderful. I would like to open the floor, maybe if there's any questions that the students might have. I do have several other questions for Jarrett, but I want to uh, give the opportunity. I see a couple of hands raised. Adriana, maybe you want to share? Okay, hello. <clears throat> I just say I'm like super excited that you're here because I'm currently a barista and I have like a serious passion for coffee and I also want to open my own coffee shop. So I have two uh questions for you. Um, first, how did you go about researching like what kind of coffee bean you wanted to serve in your own coffee shop? And also like when it comes to consistency with drinks, how do you go about making sure that every person can produce the quality of drink that you want them to? Yeah, so both really good questions. So for the first one, as far as picking your type of coffee, um, I read as much as I could, you know, and I, I did as much research as I could either by going to cafes um, or, or reading books or reading blogs. And so there's, there's several good books out there. Um, some of the bigger specialty coffee shops like Blue Bottle, Stumptown, Intelligentsia, they're still considered specialty coffee, but they're sort of the leaders in the industry. So I look to them for knowledge. Um, and a couple of them have written books and that kind of thing. So I started there. Um, I mean, and then once you learn coffee, you, you, you know, you learn that it's really about geography and there's only a certain amount of countries that produce coffee. And so for me, it's, I don't choose, I, I've never chosen just one place. It's really, it's seasonal, right? And so it, it, throughout the year, you'll learn that it actually, you know, parts of the year comes from Ethiopia, parts of the year comes from Honduras. And so, you know, 
it, it'll change throughout the year and each one has a different sort of nuance to it or a different flavor like central america has a sort of identifiable flavor and then ethiopia has a little bit different but um so once you start digging into that and you really start learning um you know the geography of it or or the places that they come from at least and the and the way that they're roasted it sounds like a lot but it's not too bad um then that'll give you a good idea of okay, what type of coffee do I want to serve? And, you know, what's considered good coffee and what's considered bad. I did some training. I went to um, Idaho where they manufacture these coffee roasters. Uh, and I, I did a three-day class there learning how to roast coffee. Because initially, I didn't mention this, I actually was only going to roast coffee. I kind of wanted to be like the buddy brewer of St. Pete. I wanted to have a roasting uh, machine inside the cafe. And I actually bought one and I had it ready. And I was going to roast coffee. So when you walk in, you see someone roasting, you smell it and the whole thing. And when I got the pop up open, I realized, you know, A, it's a lot of work just running a cafe. And B, I think my skill was better with front of the house and people than it was being in a warehouse, like one on one with a coffee roaster. And so I decided to focus on the cafe portion of it. Um, So and then for the second part of your question, as far as consistency goes, um, you know, what, once you have a reliable coffee supplier, for example, the, you know, that the product isn't going to change very much. So, okay. So, you know, that's consistent, which is good. And that's actually can be hard to find. You have to have a, someone that you trust and someone that is really good at what they do. And we work with good coffee roasters that have been doing it for a long time and they're not distracted doing 20 other things and they just really roast coffee. Well, so your product is stable. Right. And in, in the liquor industry, like, you know, it's always stable, basically, like they make the vodka the same way. Tito's is made the same way over and over again. So that's good. And then once you, you, you know, I have a recipe sheet at Intermezzo, for example, of the exact way I want an old fashioned made or, or a cappuccino made. And when I hire someone, we train them to do it that way. And um, we, we try to make it as, you know, at least margin of error as possible. So, for example, our espresso machine can be set to have an automatic, uh, it pulls the same shot of espresso every time, you know, we weigh every single shot and it's, it's a, it's a step that takes an extra five seconds and the customer has to wait an extra five or 10 seconds. But I know that that coffee is going to come out the same every time. And, you know, and they will come back because the coffee is consistent ideally. And so we weigh every single shot of espresso and we have the machine dialed in to where, okay, we know that, 18 grams of coffee go in and we hit the button then 42 grams comes out or whatever it is. So, so once you, you know, and luckily you're a barista, so you can like sort of put those things into practice and keep those in mind. That's the best case scenario is if you have your goal in mind while you're working at someone else's job, you can sort of learn under their belts or learn, um, you know, on their dime, so to speak, or on their clock, so to speak. Yeah, right? I've definitely noticed, like, I have customers who will come up when I'm working and they're like, oh, finally you're here. Like, you can make my coffee the way I want it versus when they see somebody else who they know will, like, produce their coffee maybe not the way they like it. They, like, right. don't come and shop. And I'm like, when I own my coffee shop, I don't want them to ever feel like they can't come and get a coffee because somebody else is there, you know? A hundred percent. Yeah. <clears throat> I appreciate all Great of your question. knowledge, yeah. Yeah, of cool. course. Stay in touch. I mean, Jared's going to share his uh, email or how to keep in contact with him later on. Uh, Cian, I know Absolutely. we have a few more hands raised. Maybe you can organize that. Um, yeah, I think Ethan is up next. Yep. Hi, Jared. So I was just wondering, like, how did you raise the money to pay for the lease to start with? Like, where did it come from? Yeah, so that's a good question, too. Um, so when I was working while in school, so I did two years at USF St. Pete. And while I was working, or I'm sorry, while I was going to school, I, I had two jobs, actually. And so one job was bartending uh, downtown. I was actually working at Mandarin Hyde, if you know that bar. I actually started as a, a door guy, right? And so, and then I worked my way into a bartender position. And then my other job was working at Locale Market when that was still here. I was working upstairs at the restaurant as a bartender and you know, when, as soon as I find out the Mina group was opening a restaurant in St. Pete, I emailed them like a year ahead. And they're like, you know, we're like 12 months from hiring, but we'll keep you in mind. And so by the time they came around, I was like first in line and I got the job as a bartender, which was 
a sought after position there because it was so busy, especially in the beginning, the first year. And so all that money that I made though, I, I, I saved like 80% of it, you know? And when I first opened, I only bought the bare necessities to have a cafe. And so I, I just bought the espresso machine, the espresso grinder and some cups and like, uh, like furniture from Ikea. And so I ended up, you know, it might, it was like between 10 and $15,000, um, which was like all the money I had basically. Right. And, um, I was lucky in the sense that we were doing this pop-up because we had this like a prorated rent where it was only rent for three months. And, um, you know, after, in fact, you know, after we had this partnership, we, I don't even know, I think we, we mitigated the rent to very little or nothing because we decided to keep it long-term and partner together. And so again, like serendipity played this role. I just got very lucky with that. Uh, but in the beginning, I didn't know that. And I just spent the money on the equipment thinking that, okay, worst case scenario, I could sell it and make like 90% of it back or best case scenario. I take everything I buy and I move it into a new location. But I, I essentially just worked and I, I saved, you know, some money. So. All right. Thank you. Sure. I think uh, P Piero has a question. Yeah. Hi, Jared. Uh, I have a question about the pop-up logistics. How, how did you came about that and was it uh, nervous for you to invest in a new pop-up? Yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, when I, when I first went after the space, right, like I said, I, I didn't know that we were going to do the pop-up. It was sort of suggested to me and I decided to do it that way because I, I didn't really have another alternative. I could have went and leased the space long-term somewhere else, but it was a great location. And I love the fact that it was only three month a three month commitment because, you know, I, I had confidence in what I was doing, but I also knew that there's a lot of things I had to learn. And so I was like, well, this is great because I could learn with a lower amount of risk. And um, yeah, so, and then what was the other, I'm sorry, what was the second part? Um, could you describe the logistics of a pop-up, like your pop-up business? Yeah. yeah, so usually uh, a pop-up, I mean, if you think about a pop-up, I always think about in New York or LA or something, they have these spaces that are available for bigger companies generally, like say it's Nike and they're like releasing a shoe or like, I think Kanye West did a pop-up when he did a concert in New York and he sold like all of his Yeezy gear and he had a line like three blocks around just to buy like a t-shirt or something. Uh, and so that's usually what the pop-up is. It's really a marketing ploy. It's really like for a bigger company, they do a pop-up, they take a space for 24 hours and they spend like 50 grand, let's say if it's a really big company, right? Like 50 grand to deck it out. Like if they're releasing a shoe, they'll make the, the whole store look like a shoe box or something or like, right. And they'll put a thousand shoes on the wall. And it's something that just causes buzz, right? It's like, it's only going to be there for 24 hours. So you got to get there now or never. And, you know, you got to see it because they, they put this crazy thing inside of the space. And it's just one of those things that you can't turn your head if people do it right. And so we did it as a longer term one, but, but it still caused a buzz because people were like, oh, this coffee shop's only here for three months, so you got to go. And the space was very pretty. It was all white and it had terrazzo floors and tall ceilings. And so everyone wanted to check it out before it ended. And so that helped give it momentum. Um, so, and the same thing with the oyster bar that we had, it was like the oyster guy was only supposed to be here for a few weeks. He ended up staying for over a year or maybe two years um, because it was so popular, but in the beginning we said, this is only going to be here for a few weeks and, uh, you know, the demand showed up and so we kept it. Thank you. Are there any more hands raised? Sienna? Um, so I have a question. So I know you talked about the, um, positive word of mouth really, let's say launched your business. Like what other, public relations or marketing did you do to like promote um intermezzo well instagram was big uh for us for sure because the space was a pretty space and um people would come in and they would take a picture of the space and their friends would see it and say you know where is this and then people would and when when we first opened it was basically just me working i had one other person at the very end of that three month span 
but it was me seven days a week. And then I learned that seven days is a lot. So I did six days. But um, I would ask every single person, how'd you hear about us? And I, you know, I promise you it was like three out of five people were like Instagram. And so, and I'm lucky, you know, I, I've always lo- like loved photography. And so I enjoyed doing like running my, you know, I, I still run our Instagram. I, I enjoy it. I like taking pictures and stuff like that. And I, I don't take it that seriously. A lot of people go, you know, they're like, oh, everything's got to match or, uh, you know, there's got to be a flow or something like that. I don't, I don't, I'm sure there is a science to it, but I just like, I just enjoy it and try to put a personality into it. And so we did that every day. I would post pictures of drinks and the drinks, you know, we try to make them look good and visually appealing. And so that helps. But also there's one other thing. Uh, in the beginning, what I did was because I came from the bar industry, I always had this urge to want to create drinks and garnish them and, you know, like do cocktails, but I couldn't because we didn't have a liquor license at the time. So what I did was one of the first drinks that we ever did was called an espresso mint julep. And it was a, it was essentially a mint julep, but instead of bourbon, we did it with a shot of espresso and it sounds weird, but it is so delicious. And it is, you know, fresh mint with sugar and espresso and you shake it. And I used to have this, this bag, they call it a Lewis bag. And it's like this canvas bag with a mallet and you put ice into it and you break up the ice into pebble ice and you take, you scoop it out and put it into a glass and you pour the drink in and you garnish it with this beautiful mint bouquet. And it was an espresso mint julep and no one had one around here before. And, um, people started taking pictures of that drink and that drink started, becoming popular i never put it on this menu to this day and people still ask for it um and so that that kind of helped get it going as well as just something that was different you know so yeah that's really interesting cool i think dirk and cassie will have questions hi jared a very interesting uh, story there uh, I have two questions. Uh, do you have a particular target customer in mind, uh, you know, for your uh, for your shop? And how do you reach that target customer? Or are you pretty much open to anybody who is uh, who feels like having a cocktail or having a coffee? And a second question is, uh, how important is innovation for you? Do you introduce new coffee flavors and new types of cocktails on a regular basis? And uh, where do you get these ideas from? Uh, are they coming from outside, from uh, maybe competitors, new trends in the market? Or are you developing them in-house? So these are my two questions. Thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> those are both good. So for the first one, uh, how, do I, how do, I, do I have a customer in mind and how do I reach them? So in the beginning, when I opened, I always wanted people, you know, sort of my own age. I wanted college students because I was when I developed the idea, I was in school and I wanted a place to go study. And that was also like a cool spot and that had a quality drink. And in my opinion, I couldn't really find it. And so um, what I wanted to do was provide a place for I'll call them like young professionals. So it was anyone who was in college up to you know, 30, uh, that they're still building their career or they, they're just getting into their career, but they want something that, um, you know, something that is of quality that matches what they like. And so I, I didn't, I didn't do too much research on it. I'll I'll be honest. Like I didn't try to come up with demographics or come up with like, you know, what do these people generally want and then try to give it to them. I really, felt like I was already in that group, I guess. And so I just did what I, what I liked and then people generally liked it. Right. And you start to, you start to see what items sell and what items are not popular and that kind of thing. And you could, you could push it in a certain direction to cater more or less to that audience. Uh, but you know, I love having, I, frankly, everyone, I love having everyone there. I love that the fact that intermezzo is you can walk into intermezzo on any given day and you could see a person who is, you know, 19 on their computer getting work done, sitting next to them. You could see two 65-year-old ladies, like, drinking coffee, talking about whatever, reading the newspaper, um, and, and, and everyone in between. I mean, it really is – I try to – and going that's going back to the hospitality component is I try to make everyone feel welcome. 
And I believe that a space, the way you design it, sort of, uh, you know, like, I don't know if it sort of like, you know, filters people in and people out, like people decide whether they like it or not based on the design of the space. And I did think about that a lot. I did think about the way that the space is laid out and the way it's designed. Um, and I think some people are drawn to that and some people are not. And Intermezzo, if, if anyone's been there, it has usually been pretty, it's like the walls are big and stark, kind of stark. And it's a little bit more minimalist and mid-century. And some people like that. And some people want something that's more homey and cozy. And they, there's like, there's like stuff all over the walls and stuff hanging or whatever, but I, I didn't like that. So I didn't do that. But, um, so I think, you know, the, the young professional demographic is the one that I always wanted because that's the one I kind of most identified with. And I wanted to have conversations with and that kind of thing, but it's grown a lot from that. And then, um, so, for, and then for the second part of your question, um, Oh, actually, I'm sorry. Remind me the second part of your question again. Uh, how important is innovation for for the for the shop? Uh, do you do you uh, experiment with new coffee flavors and new types of cocktails, and do you develop them in house? Or, you know, or are you looking outside for new trends in the market? Uh, you know, looking at your competitors, maybe. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So I. I'm constantly looking at what other people are doing, um, like people that I look up to and companies that I look up to. So on the coffee side, it could be cool cafes all the way from Italy and France to Los Angeles or New York, right? And so I'm kind of paying attention to what, you know, and these guys are like the trendsetters, so to speak, because they're in these big cities. So I'm kind of paying, you know, I keep my thumb on that. Um, it is important to have new items, but it, it's, I think it's more important to be consistent and to just overall have a high quality product that is consistent. Um, you know, for example, we, part of our success on the cocktail portion of things is, is because we just make classic cocktails balanced and correctly. We, you know, a lot of people like a simple drink, like an old fashioned and believe it or not, even though it's only three ingredients, it's really hard to find a good version of that and not saying that we make the best one, but we definitely make one that is a balanced version of that. And that is historically accurate. And it's, you know, it's, it's a real representation of what the drink should be actually. And so I'm always obsessed with sort of, I call it like the North star of everything, like where, what is the classic representation of something? And then I can learn the deviations of that. Um, and go, okay, this is the way an old fashioned is supposed to be made. Now, where do we fall on the map or are we consciously doing this? Like, you know, so now we can consciously make a variation of that drink and we won't call it an old fashioned. We'll call it another name because it's not quite an old fashioned. It's a play on that. And so part of our cocktail menu, and you'll find this at a lot of cocktail bars, for example, is that there's only, if you really distill it down, they say that there's only about five types of drinks even though we know there's a million, but really there's five types. And if you look at the drink carefully, the basic formula of those drinks is almost the same. It's like the same build of a drink. Right. And so, um, you know, we, we come up with new drinks seasonally. We change our menu about twice a year, sometimes three times a year uh, to, to keep it fresh. Um, but people love certain drinks. They, they, they find one that they love and it's hard for us to take it off. Um, and so it's a balance between, trying to be seasonal, trying to be innovative, but also trying not to get, you know, like people upset because we, we are taking away what they want. Um, so I think there is a balance. I think there's restaurants, farm to table restaurants, right. And they change, some of them change every month. Some of them change one, you know, three times a year, four times a year, but it's hard because I've been even that person where I go to a restaurant and I love a particular pasta, let's say, and then I go back and it's not on the menu. And I'm like, man, you know, the whole reason why I came here is because I wanted that dish. Um, and I, now I can't get it. Uh, and so it's, it's, a, it's a little bittersweet. But, but I ultimately, I have come to the point now where I believe that having a drink consistently is, I think it's better than trying to prove that we can do creative drinks every single day or every week. I'd rather give someone 
what they want uh, more often than trying to introduce new things all the time. And so, you know, to, to balance that, we have our regular menu and then we have a drink that changes every month, you know? Um, and so we have the, a creative outlet, uh, but we still offer our core line of products. So. Correct me if I'm wrong. You're also innovating in other areas. Recently, you've had a dinner and then the market's coming up. So these are other forms of innovation. Why did you adopt the, the dinner approach or how, how maybe you could share a bit about how that's working? Yeah. Yeah. So in addition to what we do normally, um, you know, I'm, I'm always doing events, right? We're always trying to do events to keep things interesting. So one of the things uh, is like last week we did this five course dinner. So a chef reached out to me. He's from Kansas City. Uh, he's a James Beard nominated chef. He owned his own restaurant for three or four years and COVID actually shut him down. And he wants to move to Florida. He's got family here. He's kind of got a foot in both places right now, but he said, hey, uh, we want to do this dinner. We need a location. We love your spot. And he came in and he had cocktails. He liked it. He, he thought it represented, it reflected what he likes to do, but in food and drink. And so we partnered together and he did, you know, we sold tickets online. Uh, I think we sold about 30 tickets and it was a five course meal with beverage pairings. And we did it at Intermezzo last Monday and it was awesome. It was, it was like Intermezzo turned into a restaurant, which is a really cool vibe. Um, Cause that's still one of my passions is hosting and serving, although it's very difficult to have a restaurant. So I choose not to do that, but, but it was fun to be able to have the balance. So, um, so that was a fun little creative thing that we did. It was just to get people in on a Monday night, which were usually closed and to serve really good food. And we had the opportunity to make creative drinks and to, to pair them with that, with that cuisine. Um, so that's one thing that we did. Another thing is I'm working on this actively. I just started, it's called the Mezzo market. And so this is a, um, like a maker's market, if you will, where we shut down Bomb Avenue. Bomb Avenue is the street right behind Intermezzo, in between Green Bench and Intermezzo, which is a cool little alley. Um, and so we shut down that street now once a month, and I coordinate 50 to 60 small businesses to pop up tents and to sell their products for you know four or five hours. It's kind of like a farmer's market, but it's more geared towards you know vintage goods and handmade items instead of food uh, and vegetables and produce. And we have a lot of music and drinks and, you know, people come and shop for four or five hours. And it's just a way to bring uh, people into the neighborhood to get businesses to collaborate with businesses. I mean, we're essentially collaborating with 50 businesses on that day uh, to do this big event. And now it's a monthly event. Uh, so that's another thing that, that we do. And that's important because I want to get the name out in the community and I want to remain, you know, uh, a name in the community and, and known as someone who does things for the community and that kind of thing. I know Cassidy has had her virtual hand up for a long time. Well, I'm, <clears throat> hello. I'm uh, happy to be here right now. I just, I, I liked what you just said about um, with everything that you're doing right now, because I kind of answered part of my question, but mostly yeah. what I was wondering is COVID, like, how did you adapt? How did it impact you? And how did you get through that? And how are you continuing to get through it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, obviously affected everyone, no matter where you're at in the world for the last year now, almost. Uh, so, so when COVID started, it was, I remember it was like March 15th, I think, or around that time. And, uh, the first thing I did was sort of turn to the employees and say, are you guys comfortable working or not comfortable working? Because I didn't want to force anyone to do it. And so, you know, a lot of the employees for the first two weeks thought, okay, let's, let's slowly, you know, we'll, we'll get into this. We'll still work. And then after that, after a few weeks, they, they thought it, and they realized it was a lot more serious. And so pretty much everyone said, we want to take a small break. And I said, okay, that's fine. Um, personally, I, felt comfortable still working. And I knew that in reality, we still had bills to pay and that kind of thing. And so I kept Intermezzo open and I ran it by myself for a few weeks uh, and I lowered the hours. And so we went from eight to midnight every day to eight to 3 p.m. I think it was three or 2 p.m. And I only did coffee to go. 
And we, you know, we, the governor lifted this law for to go beverages. And so we started, we were the second place in St. Pete to do to go bottled cocktails. And so I immediately, like, I found a packager, I found a place where I could get bottles and caps. And I started making cocktails into go bottles and sealing them and advertising them. And that actually, I mean, man, for, for the month of like April, that saved our butts because people still wanted, they still craved uh, to go out, to have fun, to drink, and they couldn't go out. So people were buying to-go drinks and going home or going to the park and just hanging out. Um, and so we were luckily the first ones to do that. But um, the middle part of the year was rough, right? I mean, we had very little revenue. We probably had 20 or 30 percent of our typical revenue coming in than we're used to for for several months. And then as the year went on, um, the employees got more comfortable and they wanted to come back to work. I was comfortable. And so I thought, OK, we'll open up to some degree. Um, and anyone who, you know, I, any person who feels comfortable coming out will come in. And if not, that's fine. And we'll, we'll take all the precautions. We spaced out tables and had hand sanitizer. The weather is good. So we kept the garage door open for airflow and that kind of thing. And we still do. Um and so we kept it very lean and I just, I worked a lot more myself behind the bar and we, you know, we only kept one or two people on staff, uh, like behind the bar at all times, essentially. I still tried to keep everyone on staff, but we just ran a leaner team to try to, um, prevent waste and that kind of thing. We, I cut the menu down to like 50% of our offerings to prevent waste. Uh, this way we're not ordering as much produce and we're not ordering as much, you know, basil or whatever it is. And, that kind of thing. And so our revenue picked up, but it still wasn't where it's at. Um, and then towards the end of the year, we, we picked up and we were doing good again. And so this year it started off good. And, um, I mean, you know, we have no complaints right now. We're, we're, we're busy and we're, we're still taking it seriously. And, uh, you know, all the employees wear masks and that kind of thing. Um, but there's a few months there where it was rough and I, I didn't know what was going to happen. We did get our PPP loan and that helped us a lot. Uh, but it, it definitely is lasting longer than I thought. It's definitely more serious than I thought. The first two weeks, I was like, oh, this thing will blow over. And then it just got worse, as everyone knows. Um, and so, um, you know, w I think we're lucky because we we came off of a good year last year, like a good season in December. We do this big Christmas event called Miracle. And we always do well with it. And so luckily we sort of saved all that money. And we literally said, my, my partner and I, let's save this for a rainy day. And then we ended up having 12 months of rainy days. And so we were able to be in a good place. Uh, we planned for it sort of not knowing and, uh, and then got the loan of course. And so with all those things, we were able to survive and keep going. So, but, uh, but yeah, not awesome. an easy one. Yeah, I'm glad um, to hear that. One of the yeah, one of the last questions that I enjoy asking all our guests is to reflect back. If you could go back to your younger self and give your younger self some advice, what would you say to him? That's a good question. Um, well, there's a few things. Um, one of the things I would do, or what what I would say to myself is to. Um, well, for one, to sort of take school more seriously, because I, I, I didn't take school seriously until my last two years. Uh, and that's when I really learned the most and I made the most connections. But the first two years of school, I was still very much a kid, you know. Um, but I think the benefit, one of the reasons why I went to US, USF is because it's a relatively smaller college. And I, a lot of people want to go to the big universities and have that whole experience. But that experience is almost purely social uh, and it doesn't really help your, I mean, it, it can help your career in a lot of ways, but one of the reasons I like USF is because it's a little bit smaller and you can make connections with leaders in the community easier and you can make connections with your professor easier and you can be in a class and there's only 20 or 30 students and you can raise your hand and ask a question and he'll answer it, he or she will answer it right there and then, whereas if you're at, you know, a big school, it's hard to do that. It's hard to have that personal interaction and to break up into small groups and that kind of thing. And so one of the things I would tell myself is to utilize that more and to, you know, get to know your professors and your peers and leaders 
better and like the dean and things like that because they're only one degree away whereas if you're at you know like uf or something you have you know 50,000 students right like there are many degrees away and there's a line to get in the door to meet someone sometimes and so that's something that i kind of took for granted and i i, I still make a connection so i'm happy i did but that's one important thing that a lot of people don't realize is that there is a benefit to being a little bit in a smaller community. Um, so, so that's one thing. And, um, you know, another thing was just to get like, get into any internship or job I could, where I really looked up to a particular person, because at the end of the day, it, it, it does matter what degree you pick, obviously, but the most important thing that will probably affect you is the person who you work under or like your mentor or your boss. And if I could work for someone who was really intelligent in like finance, and even though I was a marketing degree, but if they were like, if this was like a, someone who's really inspiring and really, um, you know, um, someone who would spend the time with me and sort of take me under their wing, but they're in a different degree, I would take that all day over a marketing internship where I don't know anyone, no one really cares, or I can't get in touch with someone who's making decisions and that kind of thing. So it's important to try to identify someone who is a leader or someone you look up to or someone who could help further your career, uh, even though it might not be the exact uh, sort of you know route you're going. It's, it, that person could give you a huge jump you know, and give you a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge. Um, those personal connections are huge. So, um, so that's something I, I always thought about. I have no regrets, but I, but I, but I do think about that. And I'm like, you know, it's important to try to get under someone's wing as a, as a mentor uh, and a mentee and that kind of thing. So. Jared, I want to say thank you for spending a Tuesday morning with us. Let's circle back in the near future to re-engage what's going on. And thank you again for sharing your wisdom and, and your story with Intermezzo and for being so inspiring. So thank you again, and I'll be in touch. Awesome. Yeah, thank you guys for being here. Thanks for having me on, and I, I appreciate you guys uh, listening to me drone on, but all good questions as well. And uh, if any of you guys have any other questions, feel free to reach out to me personally on Facebook or email or, or whatever it is. So my email is just my first name, Jarrett, at intermezzo.co. Wonderful. I will see you soon. Thank you again. All right. Thank you. Take care. Now I'd like to floor open the floor up for questions. Jared, you're welcome to stay or Dirk, you're welcome to stay. Um, of course, we've had a lot of different assignments due over the past week. Most of you guys are crushing it. I think you can see how talented the students are in, in our classes with their, their videos, uh, etc. But maybe you have some other questions um, or how or things that Jarrett may, may have mentioned that relate to our class or topics or whatever. So the floor is yours. Who's got a question or wants clarification? I Remember, have a question. Wonderful. Remember, 